If you want to get the measure of a person, introduce them to your dog. A few years ago when Barbara Rass was a featured poet at our then annual Sowell Conference here at Texas Tech, I introduced her to my dog, a German Shepherd named Kona. Barbara and Kona made goo-goo eyes at each other in Diane Warner's living room. And that's how I decided it would be okay to invite her back to Texas Tech. And we're very fortunate to have her here tonight. To be inside a poem by Barbara Rass is to be startled to attention, like that sudden crack of thunder after lightning, or like the, wind drumming, the wing drumming of a chucker flushed from a copse of juniper. And specifically in Barbara's new book, The Blues of Heaven, you are startled to attention by the astonishing, the informative, the ethical, and the fantastic. In this new book, the poems repeat words and phrases, pulling the circle in close. In one of the poems, the phrase to ignore is followed by to know, to be, and to measure. In another poem, into fire is followed by into ash, and into the past, and into the yard. And in yet another poem, I worried is followed by I worried, and I worried, and I worried. In this new book, the poems ask questions for which you suddenly want answers. Does fluid move through insects without a heart? Do the whimperings of elephants resemble my own whimperings? Haven't you burned with shame long enough? In this new book, the poems give you answers to questions you didn't know you asked. Cezanne painted until his eyes bled. At the end of the rain, Noah was left with one raisin on the ark. In the dark ages, a stew of bats was said to cure, said to cure melancholia. In addition to The Blues of Heaven, Barbara Rass is the author of three other books of poems, The Last Skin, winner of the Texas Institute of Letters Best Book in 2010, One Hidden Stuff, and Bite Every Sorrow, which won the Walt Whitman Award and the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a fellowship from the Rockefeller Foundation, her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Tin House, Granta, American Scholar, Orion, and lots of other magazines and anthologies. And for four decades, she worked in book publishing. She is the founding director of Trinity University Press. Barbara's papers are housed here in the Sowell Collection, in the Southwest Collection Special Collections Library, and we, where we've gathered to listen to her read and hopefully tell some stories and I want to thank Diane Warner and Kristen Lloyd for co-sponsoring this event with the Honors College. And because we want her to be part of our Texas Tech family, please welcome tonight Barbara Rass. <clears throat> well, I would like to thank Kurt Caswell of the Honors College, and also give him a big, generous wow for that introduction, which was pretty spectacular. I also want to thank the Dean of the Honors College, Alyssa Long, who helped to support this event, as well as Diane Warner and Kristen and Molly, her terrific staff, and thanks to all of you who came out, in particular students from the Honors College, who I had the joy of meeting earlier, and to the rest of you who I feel joyful to meet tonight. So thank you very much. I'm going to start with a poem that is called Dragonflies, and it starts 
with kind of a descriptive bit and then it takes a little tour through history and prehistory let me ask first how is the sound can you all hear me in the back is it good okay terrific dragonflies a balmy day scores of dragonflies each inscribing its own name in flight dance to tunes only they hear whizzing and flashing through tarantellas waltzes sambas a leaping lizard makes good on its name a tortoise bites off a flower top using its right leg to steady the stem i praise the palms flouncing their fronds loudly rustling in gusts swarming off the gulf all day dragonflies flirt to music music older than sumerian older than sanskrit etruscan older than a flute made of nearly transparent bird bones older even than weeping and wailing older than beating a hairy chest and roaring The day a crucial button fell off my blouse and into the toilet was the day my was the day Trudy, my nine pound terrier mutt, put her paw on my bare foot like a scrap of crushed velvet. And though I wanted to send thoughts of gratitude into her little dog brain, all I could do was envy her for not having to wear clothes or get her mental panties in a wad trying to figure out what the Nepali poet meant by Westerners love Rilke because he approaches the preliterate. It was the day I learned that Dell has a detector under their computer keys to record fist bangs and thus dodge warranties. Imagine pummeling a machine as if it could fix the brokenness of parents whose dismay about their own choices could be passed down to their kids through the knives set at the table. It was the day I learned the CIA plans to geoengineer the stratosphere by spraying toxic ash to offset global warming. And this, on a day I learned residents in Karachi are digging mass graves to prepare for another heat wave like last year's that killed 1,300 people. Increasingly, days like this end with who the hell will pickaxe a trench for me in 127 degrees. Lamentably, this poem is a little out of date because temperatures of 127 degrees have been um, recorded with more frequency and, um, and basically um, establishing more of a um, normal standard around the globe. For those of you who may be trivia nuts, I want to mention that at the end, towards the end of this poem, there are three flags of countries that represent the flags of their nations. And the three that are mentioned are three of the first flags that were actually created as national flags. For those of you who aren't trivia nuts, you can ignore that and it won't affect your appreciation of the poem. Flags. For some reason, we chose an island off Italy to bring a typewriter for repair. And meanwhile, Chianti and lounging on the balcony, pondering if Kafka had in fact invented the hard hat. And who came up with the idea of hotel maids 
folding toilet paper into triangles, pointless points. Imagine the cumulative moments the world bloody wide spent thus, instead of indulging in a decent foot soak, thinking, perhaps, about a grandmother in the village, her mother's mother, who greets her by taking both her hands and rubbing them long enough to wring out hundreds of secrets. Never forget the names of our breads, she will say. And together they'll sit, gazing out at the horizon, one thing we have in common, seeing as we too are looking out at it now, the horizon holding up the entire sky. All day, pulling down the sun, that golden child reluctant to go to bed. And when there is wind, sending scrolls of whipped cream to our shores. But forget flags, the horizon refuses flags. None of that vain flappery, whether the saltier of Scotland the eagles of Albania, the wounded sheep of Latvia, flags flown in theaters, colonies, operations, flags carried on the children's crusade, rags, no doubt, flags for genocide after genocide after genocide. We find it humanly possible to abide. There are a lot of poems in this book that lament the passing of my only sibling, a brother who was close to my age, who died at age 62, and um, it was a very unpredictable and sudden demise from a, a very aggressive form of cancer. And it, it, was, it was really shocking to me, both the fact and the suddenness and a wise woman said to me, you know, we expect our parents and our grandparents to die, but somehow we never think about our siblings dying. And I recognized that that was, that was really true. So I wrote this poem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about where I grew up so that you can understand some of the references. I grew up in a fishing town on the coast of Massachusetts called New Bedford, Mass. And it was um, one of, at, at one point, it was one of the richest towns in the US because of the whaling industry, which it led with great infamy as we think of it now. But at the time, it was um, a cause for abundance and celebration because it brought such wealth to the town. And one of the things that was typical, and this was typical of the house I was raised in, although the house was not grandiose in the way that this is going to sound, but on, it was a three-story house, and on top it had a widow's walk, which is a little room, and inside that room widows would look out towards sea waiting for their husband's ship to come home and often these whaling voyages would go and then they'd be they'd be gone for two three years so it was called a widow's walk because often the ships that they were looking for did not come home and in fact the house i grew up in was owned by my immigrant grandmother who bought, as I said, a house that could have been called grandiose. And what she did was immediately carve it up into, an, into apartments because why would you live in all of that space if you could rent it out and make money? But in any case, I had access to this widow's walk and it was a place where as a lonely kid, I would go up and stare out at the harbor that I could see you know, maybe a mile away from um, where I was lurking. So this is called Survival Strategies. 
to dig for quahogs, to feel their edges like smiles and pull against their suck to toss them in a bucket, to feel the wind as a friend, to feel its current as luck, to ignore Capricorn and Cancer, presuming to slice the globe, to know the lie and names can never hurt you, to be a gull breezing the blue, eating nothing but clouds, to measure your ties to the past by the strength of cobwebs, to haunt the widow's walk, its 12 narrow windows, each the size of a child's coffin, to watch the harbor where the Akushnet runs into Buzzards Bay before it was named a super fun site full of PCBs, to wonder if that water you swam in summer after aimless summer could get you the way something got your brother too fast, too soon, to bury or burn the whole family you were born to and talk to them only through the smoke of letters you torch at their graves, to see a snake with a ladybug on its back and still refuse to pray. That poem makes reference to something that is a Buddhist tradition, um, which is instead of praying or speaking to the dead at the site of a burial or the site of a death, what they typically do is write letters and burn them with the idea that the smoke will rise up into the atmosphere and thus communicate with the people who have departed. Before I read this poem, I want to issue a disclaimer, and that is that it is not authorized or um, not at all recommended by the American Heart Association. It's called Recipe for Sleep. Fill your belly with pasta mixed with arugula, olives, cherry tomatoes, garlic equal to two months worth of Ambien, and a healthy dose of olive oil. Infused with Meyer lemons that grew in your Berkeley yard, another loss you long to forget. In bed, try to ignore the fire ants building a nest in the petty parts of your brain. Lingering garlic won't help to banish them, or the ghoulish replays of parties where you felt like a goat in a tree, or release you from tomorrow's junk box of the many people you'll disappoint. Remember the composer whose success came after taking her teacher's advice to look in the mirror 10 times a day and repeat, I can do it. If you get up to go to the bathroom and turn on the tap, don't think about the water on demand rushing from its own sleepless place. Don't think about the South African women collectively walking the distance of 16 times to the moon and back daily to carry water. If I can do it, doesn't do it. Think about the luck of your life. Recite in alphabetical order the names of your friends, or in a random list, name all the people who've hurt you, make up ways to forgive them. And as for that can of worms you carry around, even to bed, at least be glad you've been spared thus far from opening it.
a day in the park. From here on my bench, I can play the happy prophet to the pigeons I love for their iridescent necks, a trick light can do with feathers, but not with hair. And on odd hours, I don the role of raconteur of my fickle past and admire the squirrels sitting up to eat, two dainty paws and such tiny nibbles by ruthless jaws. I can walk or sit alone and not be sucked into a flock swelling the sky, arcing into gorgeous swoons, random roundabouts, not migrating like the geese I heard for a month in the north honking overhead, honking through every sun, every moon, no summer caches of nuts to redeem them, and how many calories spent calling out, begging, the way a kid on a bicycle might beg with a rubber horn to a faster rider ahead. Don't leave me, that kind of honking. But already it's dusk and the bell ringing has begun. The custodian who locks the park walks the paths in a black dress, black hose, ringing us away. Though I have not yet spent all my stale bread or finished confessing my sins to the pigeons and the squirrels who listen and look. They look back at my whispers with one eye, always one eye, as is the habit of priests bored in their dark boxes. Take a chance. From the drummer, take the cymbals, the crash and hi-hat, and walk like you're shining. From the composer, take water under snow is weary, sung by young voices in the timber of wind blowing through deer antlers. From the organ maker, take the names of the stops, night horn, Vox Celeste and Chimney Flute, whose reverberations could theoretically go on forever. From the gypsy, take any castanets offered and play them, first thing to get you out of bed, despite the news of nine dead in Charleston, who invited a white kid into their prayers at the Emanuel AME Church, where he repeatedly shot the gun whose one note is death. Take a chance, take guns away, and ask people to hum more, to whistle if unlike me they know how, to talk often like baby turtles who start vocalizing inside their eggs. Every river's original name was water weeping, water laughing. Take the call of a cricket or a ricochet of crickets each with its own thumbprint. Take the cry of a bush baby at night that narrows down to nothing the distance between it and us. Both are wailing scored by loneliness, shocking the night air, calling for kin, calling for help to perpetuate the species. Take a lesson from the bush baby with its exotically large eyes that see what we don't see, its paws and mouth that eat whatever they kill. So, um, Robert Frost said something like, home is where when you go, they have to take you in and this is a poem where I had to be um, taken in from taken in when I was, as they say, between things. So um, it refers to being It refers to 
being there in my parents house and it refers to having crossed two continents and the reference sounds um, like a stretch but in fact I went to um, graduate school at the University of Oregon and then came back to Massachusetts and then left Massachusetts and went to Cali, Colombia where I taught English as a foreign language for a year and it was when I returned from that trip that I was between things. And it, the title of this is Soul, and it's S-O-L-E, as in the, the fish, filet of soul, not soul as in the body. Soul. I remember riding a bird flying fast into snow being back in the States, thinking of a lost love, and typing, as usual, on the Smith Corona manual passed on to me by my father. And while I was trying to find myself in the hometown, I had already crossed two continents to escape. I waitressed at Louis on the wharf, across from Aiello's fish house, and on breaks, the fish workers would cram the restaurant for coffee and pie, and I'd make my way through their black rubber boots and aprons, all sequined with fish scales, their smell and shining wretched and resplendent, while Louis stared out the window as if to ask the air for some truth. And I wished I could have been at a matinee of the Children of Paradise, showing against all odds in a theater there, while dozens of customers yelled their orders, most for regular coffee, as we called it. So before pouring coffee, I had to pump cream into the cup. No pitchers on the table, no tiny plastic tubs of whitening destined for a future, this future, where Manny Aiello will never appear again to give me a five-pound box of soul, slices of fish as fresh as petals dipped in salt water. So the title of this poem, Salad Days, maybe you've heard the expression. It's used in a lot of contemporary culture, pop references, and um, it, ha it has come to have a, a, a meaning that refers to having a carefree, innocent youth. It was, it, but it first appeared in um, Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, where it had a little more of an undercurrent of regret and the reason I mention Shakespeare is because it appears in the poem, and without having reference to that allusion, you might think, well, you know, why did Shakespeare come into the poem? Um, yeah, that's all. Salad days. How easy, then, the fun house at Lincoln Park, before it grew into a field of weeds, you could buy five tickets for a buck from a blank face in a booth and enter the dark with your brother to be scared by tilting floors, phony doors, corpses bursting out of coffins, and once out into blue sky, run breathless to your mother and father, happy. You could have called them salad days, but why would you? No one in your family had read Shakespeare, so you bought french fries, doused them with malt vinegar, the four of you competing for your share of potatoes improved by salt and grease, and nothing in those early evenings free of care could have prepared you to be the last one left, the one with grief to spare. Okay, I'm going to read two more poems, and um, we didn't talk 
Kurt or Diane about whether we want to open it up to some Q&A afterwards. Yes? Okay. So I'll finish with these two poems, and then if anyone has questions, you can ask them, and I'll do my best to um, respond. This is another poem in which my dog, well, at the time, two dogs make their appearance. As Kurt mentioned, I have a fondness for dogs, and I think that sometimes they can be more lovable and loyal than um, the two-legged variety of um, creatures. This is called Balance. A hummingbird whose heart weighs less than a penny will die if it goes a few hours without eating, its flame lit to flicker and feed. What is the bodily fluid inside insects and does it move by a mechanics that is heartless? Today, we are waiting for tonight to release the nematodes in the yard to eat fleas and let the dogs, 10 parts dignity, 10 parts joy, the rest hell's bells, lick our wounds while we stroke their ears to get closer to the higher realms. A flea will swim in wine until it dies lonely, and who knows how many I've swallowed. Dear loneliness, if we have to live together, please wear the tiny polka dot gloves my daughter wore one, wore one fancy day decades ago. Give me a ball peen hammer so I can dent things my own way. Help me measure the distance the moon moves without fanfare away from the earth each year. And please share the equation that balances swamp and drain, villainy and virtue, make and break. I realize that I should have perhaps prefaced this poem by saying that nematodes, which are the fossils or remnants of single-cell diatoms have very um, sharp edges. And if you spread them in your yard, they will kill the fleas. So hence, we are waiting for night to spread the nematodes, which would then kill the fleas, which I had inadvertently been drinking, and thus the end of the poem which um, led to loneliness. Okay, this is the last poem, and it's called Tethers. And it's not on the page that I wrote, so give me one moment. The Table of Contents, what, an, what a great invention. A friend of mine is reading a book called index comma of. I think I'm going to read that. It doesn't, isn't helping me. Somebody should write a book about contents lost. Okay, I got it. Don't despair. This isn't going to last all night. So I, I made some mention to um, going to confession, and I did grow up as a Catholic, and some of that imagery comes into this poem, um, and then it just takes off and goes into another country. And I find, I mentioned this um, in a conversation earlier today, I find that when I travel, that incidents that I see strike me as really startling and new, and they find their ways into a poem, mysterious, um, sort of by their own mysterious ways, not necessarily by intention. And I think that poetry has a mind of its own, and as you start to write, things will 
line up in a way that you hadn't expected and will line up better than if you would have this plan in mind you know like an outline for a paper or some kind of outline for a short story i think that poetry really depends a lot on the unconscious and things rising to the occasion when you need them and that happened in this poem Tethers. God, we need rain and white flowers, petals mimicking teeth and eggshells, and don't forget the christening gown. The lapsed, I still respond to holy water. All the fingers before me, all the fingers to come, a balm soothing like ancient rain. I'm still blown away that we walk on a blue ball spinning at a thousand miles per hour and a foot wedded to gravity keeps us from a fling out of this world. Once in a Moroccan market, I watched a man and his donkey deliver bread to a stall and after one round flat loaf fell on the dusty cobblestones, he picked it up, brushed it off, and kissed it. I'd have eaten that bread, hugged the donkey, danced with the kissing man, one hand in the air, waving the way an olive branch waves in a slow wind, the vibrations of oud music carrying us in a circle, tying us in a small knot of humanity. Thank you. Questions? I would say both. And I would also say that I believe wide reading informs my poems because I'll read a passage and I'll think, Wow, that's an interesting fact, and I will have no idea whether it'll ever appear in a poem, but I'll jot it down in my notebook, and then suddenly, um, at the right moment, it'll rise to the surface, or in a moment of desperation, I'll start flipping madly through a notebook thinking, oh my God, oh my God, now what, now what? And then that phrase will come to me, but I believe in reading philosophy, natural history, geography, whatever kinds of um, books interest you. I, you know, I think reading fiction and, of course, why would I leave this to last? Because it's probably the most important thing to read poetry and just read everything you can get your hands on because you learn from reading what the masters have done. Uh-huh. Do I think about existential issues when I'm writing about the climate crisis? Yes, and I have to say that a lot of the issues of our day um, obsess me and depress me and I I haven't read some of the more dire ones today because I think that the news itself is bad enough without hurting you with more details that you don't need to know about at this very moment but I think that poets have if not an obligation to witness, at least some need or um, now I'm going to back up. I think poets do have an obligation to witness, and 
I don't think that means to hit readers over the head with information that becomes polemical, but to insinuate information into a poem that is personal and, you know, as in the, the poem about the, um, the graves in Karachi, I mean, that, that was something that I owned as someone who heard that and, who, and I translated that fact to myself. So I wasn't just saying, you know, oh, boo-hoo-hoo, this is happening in the world. And I think that one of the ways in making, to make a political poem successful is to relate it to your own experience or to your own feelings. You're welcome. I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you, but I think you're asking, did I always write in response to political... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's been a slow movement from my earlier poems. I think that's been present, but I think that it's become a drumbeat in my poems that's gotten more persistent and a little bit louder. And I think it's also because our world is in more peril and it's harder to really um, ignore. Kurt? How does uh, travel fit into your work That's a great question. Well, for one thing, when I travel, it released me from my day job, which was um, 50 weeks a year. I worked for 40 years in book publishing, and unlike some jobs, for example, people who work in the, um, who work as professors who get summers off, I had a constant um, I had a, a constancy to my days. I'd never got sabbaticals. And so when I traveled, it was really a release from that desk. And some of the things that I saw, like the, the man who picked the bread up in the Moroccan market, was so magical, you know, that he kissed it and thought, okay, I'm, you know, I'm. Com I'm performing this ritual and the bread is going to be fine and I'm going to leave it on the counter and all will be well. And I thought, wow, you know, that kind of gesture is something that you would never see here or very rarely. In any case, when I, when I travel and I see things like that, I feel like I, my eyes are open in a new way and it's kind of like beginner's eyes where um, you take in something that's fresh and surprising. And so poems about travel will often come into my work. Sometimes it'll be a longer poem where it'll start with the title of a place I've visited. And other times it'll be like that poem I read about the Moroccan market where the poem will start somewhere and, you know, each of the stanzas talks about different ways of being tethered and connected to something. And then it ends with the 
dancing with the man and being connected in this small knot of humanity. So I love to travel. I love to be in places that are strange and startling and um, it's just a way of experiencing the world in a fresh and surprising and, um, and wonderful way. The, the danger, of course, in writing poems that take place in other countries is that they become mere travelogues and it's, you know, people will say, don't write about your dreams. Talking about your dreams is always boring. Well, I don't go with that because um, Jim Harrison, the famous fiction writer and fabulous poet who left us a few years ago, wrote in a terrific interview in the magazine Five Points where he said, you know, it'd be, it's only in the West where people would ignore their dreams and not pay attention to half of their conscious life. Now, I don't know if he said conscious, but, but basically half of their mental activity. And then I thought, okay, that's it. I'm writing about my dreams. <laughs> so I think that it's a question of how you do it. And if you write in... If you write badly, then the poem's going to be a travelogue, and it's going to sound like copy that was written by the country that you, you're going to, that, you know, you open a magazine and it says, Mexico, come enjoy, la vida, la tequila, blah, blah. Anyway, I'm, I think I'm overstating my point. You get it. Okay, well, ending with Mexico, <laughs> la tequila, la vida. I want to wish you all a wonderful evening, and thank you again for coming.